my God. I love it when the Lord shows me that I'm on the right path on something that I'm going to be preaching or teaching. I love it when he does that. It's just a validation of a lot of things. And interestingly, for Ridge and the choir to sing a prayer before I start this series on prayer, I was right on time. So thank you. That's why you send me them text messages. Yeah, sometimes we do communicate. Thank God for it. Yeah, the, the Bible records that as the prayer of Jabez. How many of y'all got your own prayer? Uh, they had the, the prayer of Daniel. Anybody? Well, would it be worth reading? Would anybody else find that appropriate? Or is it just full of stuff for you? Has no wider application for anyone else. I wonder what's included in your prayer. What's that commercial? What's in your wallet? What's in, what's in your prayer? So we're going to talk about prayer for the next, the next few weeks. Uh, because this prayer experience, this prayer line told me that we have a lot of people who are simply silently uncomfortable with the notion of prayer. And that's not bad. That, that's not. That's normal. As you'll see as we go into this message today, that's not, that's not a bad thing. And it's not something that is unique to us right now. This has been going on for a long, long time since Jesus was with his disciples. And so if you'll turn in your Bible with me to Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, you'll see that you are in good company if you got questions about prayer. Luke chapter 11, starting at verse one, Help us. Gives us some indication that curiosity about prayer is normal to discipleship. Luke 11 and 1. Read as follows. I'm sure Tam has already got it ready for us. Or if not, she's putting it up there. Luke 11 and 1 reads as follows. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. How about y'all read that with me, all right? Let's go through that one more time, starting right there. He said to them, when you pray, say, read it with me. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Amen. Today, I want to start a series entitled Lifeline. 
experiencing God's power through prayer, lifeline, life. Y'all remember that song, throw out the lifeline? Yeah. That's what prayer is, lifeline. I, I saw in, in the news today that a C-130 plane, military transport plane crashed. They seemed to not be able to find anybody, but there was hope, Rich, because they found a life, one of the little life buoys. There's a lifeline out there. And so there's expectation because there's a lifeline, one of the little rings that go life ring, that somebody may have been able to hold on. Inherent in the notion of a lifeline is hope. Hope, faith is inherent in it. Everybody prays, y'all. You know that? Everybody prays. Non-believers pray. Oh, they do? Non-believers pray. You get them in a situation when it's tight. And they start calling. Oh, Lord, help me. The question is, are your prayers effective? Are your prayers beneficial? I use this analogy often, and I want to tell you that it makes sense to me to use it now. Have you ever been in a store and heard someone calling, Mama, 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 or maybe Daddy, Daddy. If you've ever heard that, the way you tune in is if you know it's your child. If it's not your child, you keep on shopping. Because there's no connection to make you tune in to it. But if it's your child, you'll run three aisles, jump two carts. Do whatever you need to do because you have a responsibility to respond to your child. Why wouldn't it be the same way with the Lord? If you don't belong to him, why does he have to respond just because you get in a pinch? If you didn't sign up for the Jesus family, then why does Jesus need to come running? Doesn't that make sense? That's just basic sense, isn't it? That he doesn't have an obligation to help in every situation for every person. You mean people who have done nothing for the Lord, who don't call on him, who don't believe on him, can suddenly pull him out like a genie? Rub in the bottle and say, abracadabra, help me out. No, 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 no. There has to be some connection that draws us to the Lord. And so that brings us here. Can you imagine that scene there with the disciples? They probably had watched him for a little while. Monica, they're probably paying attention to him. You know they watched everything. They were fascinated by him because they didn't understand him. He was unlike any other man they'd ever come into contact with. He had pulled them from their various vocations with simply the notion that come and I'll make you better than you've ever been. But he didn't have anything, Ms. Johnson. He had no money. He didn't have any material things that should have drawn them. It was simply the strength of his personality. The power of who he was is what drew them in. And so they watched him and I'm sure every day and throughout the day they would see him on a regular ritual pull away to pray. Fascinating that they would watch him. And at some point, the Bible says here, Luke records, and apparently one of the disciples told him this. He must have said, Luke, we were sitting there watching this man because we were so fascinated by him because Luke wasn't there. 
If you know the history of the Bible, Luke was not one of his disciples. Even though he records this, Luke wasn't there. But one of the disciples had to come, Marche, and tell him, we were sitting there watching him, and one of us got brave enough. When he got up one day after praying, we watched him. We got up and we said, Master, can you, can you teach us? Can you teach us how to pray? Now, the only reason they would want to do that is because they must have seen some results that came from him praying. They must have seen him engaging in this activity that we call prayer, and immediately after that activity, they must have seen something that they desired from it. That's why we pray. You know, that's why you see somebody go in the kitchen and all you hear is a whole lot of noise going on pots and you smell something and a little while later somebody comes out and they got a cake or a pie or something and before long you realize that there's something going on in the kitchen that gives a result that's pleasing to me and so before long anybody would say can you teach me how to do what you do in the kitchen that's what the disciples are doing here they want to know how to pray and what what jesus christ teaches them is instructive as we start on this study on how we ought to be praying. Now, I'm going to say this at the outset because we live in a generation that is, right now, argumentative. Got a voice and a word about everything. And not only are they argumentative, they're very opinionated. When I was growing up, and I'm not that old, but when I was growing up, there was a time when you just didn't open your mouth. Even if you knew different, you just shut up. Yeah, because the consequence of opening your mouth was going to be worse than being right. All right, so you just shut up. And then if it panned out that you were right, you come up with what you know. But now that's not how we raise our children. It's our fault. We've raised our children to think they can say what they want to say when they want to say it and lodge an argument against anything, I, I got an opinion and I have to state it. Guess what? You don't. You don't. You don't have, not only do you not have to state your opinion every time, you don't always have the right opinion. And so, of course, prayer is going to be one of those subjects where everybody thinks, I got this. I got this. There's no right or wrong. And I'll stand right here and tell you, I can't tell you how you ought to pray. I'll tell you that from the beginning. I can't tell you that. You pray the way you think you ought to pray. I can teach you what Jesus said. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach you what Jesus said prayer ought to be like. Now, how you do it after that is between you and the Lord. But make sure, make sure you understand what you're doing. If you want it to be effective. Because uh, what, what, what may have worked for you in the past may continue to work. And, and that's fine. That's fine. But I just want to give you this instruction on it. There are two of these versions of prayer in the Bible, one in Luke and one in Matthew. When I started reading it, you probably thought you were hearing the Matthew version. And that's because Jesus talked about this prayer twice. Twice. But if you'll notice, if you've paid attention to it, the Matthew 6 and 9 the one we call, people call the Lord's Prayer, but which is more accurately called the Disciples' Prayer, or the Model Prayer. The Model Prayer is what it's really called. The wording is different. The wording is different. And there's some things that I want to show you about these two prayers that you may not have considered at this point. First of all, not everyone is familiar with this Luke Prayer. All right, more people are familiar with the model prayer found in Matthew. But in Luke, Jesus Christ gives the same prayer with just a little difference in the variation. So the first question comes, because most of the time we hear it, people are repeating the prayer verbatim. We just repeat it. All right, and in fact, at some level, that seems to be some badge of honor. You get a Christian badge or something if you can memorize this prayer. So do you have to know it and memorize it verbatim? Is that required? Well, well, let's see. If we just use some logical things about it. First of all, Jesus gave two different prayers, and they're different. 
Jesus Christ understood what he was doing when he was giving us instruction, and if it had been necessary for us to know it verbatim, he would have given it to us the same way both times. Both times. He didn't do that. Instead, he gave us a, fraud, a broad framework of what a prayer ought to be right, be like. So, first, don't just recite it. Okay? The, you, now, look, if you read any scripture in a prayerful context, it's glorifying to God. And so from that standpoint, you can read this prayer as it is, and, and God can get the glory from it. So don't, don't mistake that. But do you have to know it by heart? And the answer is, is no. No, you don't have to. You don't have to be concerned about tripping up over it and saying trespass when it should have been dead or, you know, we get into that all the time. You don't have to get into the either one of them are uh, appropriate now there are some congregations who repeat the prayer every sunday are they wrong no that's simply part of their liturgical practice there's nothing wrong with that if that's what their ecumenical doctrine requires then that's entirely all right i'm telling you you don't have to be under that in order to be appropriate all right this prayer is is, is recorded twice and because the wording is different, we know if you don't recite it, you're all right. Another thing is, the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, not teach us a prayer. All right. There's a difference, okay? Teach us to pray, not teach us a prayer. If, they had wanted, if he had wanted to teach them a prayer, then he would have taught them what to say every time about it. But he didn't do that. He taught them how to pray, just like you learn how to drive a car. Somebody taught you how to drive a car. You don't do it exactly like the person taught you how to drive a car, but you know the, the broad framework of driving a car. I saw somebody who was struggling the other day because they couldn't drive with two feet. Some people drive with both feet. They put one foot on the gas and one foot on the, on the, on the brake. That's how they learn how to drive. And, and I can tell you right now, some folks in here like, what? How you, that's just how they drive. And in fact, when they look at you drive with one foot, they don't understand how you do it. Neither way is wrong, neither way is right. It's simply how they do it. Another reason why I want you to be careful about just repeating the prayer is because in Scripture, Matthew 6 and 7, 6, Chapter 6, chapter, verse 7, Jesus tells us to be careful about vain repetition in prayer. Amen. All right? Don't just be saying it to say it. Don't just keep on saying the same thing over and over again. One, is distracting, and two, you might not be accomplishing anything that's beneficial by just being repetitive. In fact, he used the qualifier in verse 7, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do. As the heathen do. So he equated that with something that shouldn't be done. And then lastly, you won't find that this prayer is repeated anywhere else in the New Testament by any of the New Testament believers. Surely, if it had been instructive and if it had been necessary for doctrinal purposes, you would have seen the members of the early church repeating it at some point in Scripture. And that's not in here. So Jesus wanted to give his followers a model to follow when, they were, when we were addressing God. And we can learn from this model. The model prayer that he gave took on a variety of, of ways. It can be divided into two segments, two segments of three parts each. And that's what I want to go through with you today. Two segments of three parts each. The first three deal with God's glory. First three deal with God's glory. And the second three deal with our needs. First, God's glory, then our needs in, in, that, in that order. When you start to pray, you need to remember that prayer begins with God. Yeah. Yeah. Prayer begins with God. Identifying who God is is essential as you start into prayer. 
The reason why we pray is to glorify God. We lose sight of that. You don't just pray to ask for stuff, to bless me. Now, this is going to step on some folks' toes right now. And I'm not trying to do that. I'm simply trying to mature you in your outlook when it comes to prayer. In fact, some folk don't pray until they need something. It's not a useful tool otherwise, but have you ever just sat down and loved on the Lord? Anybody in here got a significant other, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, something like that? Raise your hand if you got one. Uh-huh, don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. You ever just pick up the phone and call them and say, hey, how you doing? I ain't want nothing. I just call you to say I love you. I just call you to say you, I'm thinking about you. I just call you to say all these guys in here trying that cool, but all of them have done it before. Yeah, yeah and if they haven't, they're taking some notes down right now. <laughs> Guess what? It makes people feel good yeah. when you just call and say, I'm thinking about you. Well, guess what? God loves that as well. I just want you to know I adore you. I just want you to know I know who you are. I bless your name today. Just to reverence and adore him is significant enough for him. Just pick up the phone, the prayer phone, and call him and say, Lord, Lord, I love you. And they watched him. That's what they watched Jesus do, the disciples. They watched him sit up and do this. There is a model. Brittany and I have been talking about this a little bit lately. Yeah, I can call your name in the sermon, Brittany. <laughs> and, and she's discovered this model that a lot of churches use, a lot of people use. The teachers call the ACTS model. A-C-T-S. That you use in prayer. It's a great, great, great great model for just teaching you how to frame your prayer. How to frame your prayer. Act stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. It's just a framework that you use when you pray. Adoration. It's not on the, on the board. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If you had to have an outline for praying, the Acts model works as well as anyone, but the Acts model identifies that the first part of any prayer is God. The priority of prayer is reverence for God, acknowledging him as our Father, letting him know that we know who he is, we understand what he's done, Why is this important? Because, first of all, Jesus is teaching us this. Okay? Jesus is teaching us this. And Jesus' high priority when he was on earth was God's mission. But the power that he used in order to perform all the miracles, in order to heal all the people, in order to do all the things, the power that he used was his connection to the Father. His connection to the Father was brought about through the vehicle of prayer. If you want more power in your life, then you need the same vehicle that Jesus used, and that vehicle is called prayer. Prayer. You don't have to do anything any different. In fact, he said, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we could do greater things than he had done. Now, it's instructive for you to know that, that one of the disciples brought up the subject of prayer. Jesus didn't say, come here, disciples, I want to teach y'all how to pray. There was a curiosity from one of the disciples, probably one of them just had courage enough to say it. They had all been talking about it. But there's a curiosity that brought them to him, and I believe some of us have that same curiosity. We want to know how to pray in Jesus. Why do you think Jesus didn't gather them and say, I want to teach you how to pray? And the reason is, it should develop naturally in you. 
You ought to have something in you that wells up as you grow that makes you want to be connected closer to the Lord and want to communicate more with him. And that's how prayer becomes essential and important to you. If Jesus had said, do this, we would do it rotely every time. But when it develops naturally and organically, then you can put the power behind how much energy you put into prayer. Notice this, this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus, that the disciples came to Jesus asking him to teach them anything. There's no other time in the Gospel. He, they didn't say, teach us how to heal folk. They, they didn't say, teach us how to feed folk in the desert. They didn't ask him to teach them anything other than teach us how to pray. Jesus also knew that the power of a good example, he also knew the power of a good example. Yeah, most of us learn how to pray by watching and listening to other folk pray. And I love the fact that you don't have to have a PhD to pray well. I love that. That's, that's important. That your educational background does not mean you're the best prayer in the room. That's important because I've sat, I've sat and been instructed by some folk who I've been blessed to simply be around while they were talking to the Lord. And, 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 and most of the time, the innocence was so important that it drew more reverence in the room. And I'll give you an example. We had a deacon named Frank, we have a deacon at First Baptist named Frank Kimbrough. Brother Kimbrew is a plain spoken brother. In fact, he's got one of his granddaughters and his grandson are members here at this church. And uh, Frank Kimbrew talked to the Lord like they were sitting at the table eating lunch. That's how I like, I mean, just sitting there talking with him and having a conversation and I would just be on fire listening to him. There were not a whole lot of strong words, no big words, not a lot of adjectives and, and adverbs. He was just talking to God. And it was so very, very instructive listening to him. And I can tell you right now, plenty of young folk have learned how to pray publicly mocking somebody they heard him in court. Don't act like you didn't do it. We, we used to mock Fody Green when he used to pray. And because he get into it and, and you know back and he said, oh, oh, oh Lord. And that's what kids would start doing. If they started praying, they got to do the same thing. Well, look, look, let me, let me tell you. His mannerisms were sincere. His mannerisms, he was purely into his prayer. But picking it up and knowing that prayer is a serious thing highlighted to me that you don't play around with prayer. No, no, you don't play around with prayer. Not only that, if you look through scripture, look at all the things that the disciples did. None of them were known for their prayer. None of them. There's one that I can bring who had a nickname, James. His name was Camel Knees. That was his nickname, Camel Knees. He was Jesus' brother. And he was known as camel knees because his knees were so, so calloused from praying. This is after Jesus died. This is the same one who no doubt was messing with Jesus when he was growing up. Because Jesus said in scripture that his family gave him grief because of his witness. Sometimes the ones that give you the most trouble are the ones closest to you. You know the ones calling you church boy and, 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 and you always act like you holier than everybody else. Well, Jesus could have turned around and said, I am. <laughs> but he didn't. He just took it. He just took it. The disciples weren't known for their praying, what are the elements that are included in this model prayer? The first thing is you got to know that the priority of prayer is certainly reverence for God. He said, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? 
two things in the Greek about hallowing a name. The first means to take something that's ordinary and bring it into contact with something that's extraordinary. And if you take the ordinary thing and put it into contact with the extraordinary thing, then you're hallowing that thing. That's how it works with us. We can become set aside when we get close to something or someone that's holy. You remember in, in, in scripture, the scripture says, be ye holy for I am holy. You can't be holy by yourself. You have to have some connection with some holiness. And so uh, 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 the second thing scripture records and how you hallow something means to take something that is sacred, unique, and set it apart. Set it apart. Martin Luther said in one of his books, not Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther the theologian, said when both our doctrine and our living are truly Christian, God's name is made holy. When our doctrine, in other words, when our talk matches our walk, that's when God's holiness is truly made manifest. That's where prayer begins. You want to start praying to God, let him know you understand that he is Elohim. Make sure you understand that he's Adonai. Make sure you understand, he understands that you understand his character and his worth. That's how you start any prayer. And then the next thing in prayer, after you identify and keep his name hallow, is you identify his program. You highlight God's program in your, in your prayer. What does that mean? In, in, in scripture, the, Jesus said, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. In, in other words, whatever it is that you set in motion, whatever it is you want to accomplish, Lord, then that's what I want to accomplish. God, prayer is not asking God to do my will. That, that, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is making myself conform to God's program. Make me, break me, mold me, shape me, prune me. All of these things I'm asking God to do to put me in place so I can do his will. Many times we pray feckless, anemic prayers to God because the prayer is, and the reason why they're feckless, the reason why they're weak, the reason why they're anemic is because everything in the prayer is about my kingdom. Nothing in the prayer is about God's kingdom. All I want God to do is to lift me higher. All I want God to do is to make me great. All I want God to do is to keep everything off me, including the wind. Help me, Lord. Bless me. Put me in bubble wrap. Don't ever let anything happen to me or mine, anybody I love, anybody I ever waved at. Let all the bad stuff happen to other folk. How realistic a prayer is that in, in, instead of saying, Lord, help me to be able to deal with. Strengthen me so that whatever comes, come what may, I know you're going to be with me. Now those are mature prayers. You got to be, first of all, faithful enough to understand that God's never going to do anything to you to harm you. Even though the circumstances of life might come along and utterly damage you, God's never going to leave you nor forsake you. When it says kingdom, thy kingdom come, what, what does that mean? Kingdom in the Greek means to rule. Or, or to reign. And so, so a better way of looking at this, this, this verse, not that I, I can say it better than the original writer, but to make you understand it is if you say, Lord, I want what you want to be what happens. I want your rule to be what happens. I want what you design to take place here in this place. Let your rule take over everything. Lord, we sing that song all the time. You reign. Yeah. Or he reigns. 
That's what I want to happen. I want him to be in charge. I'm not dependent on Barack. I'm, uh, I'm dependent on Elohim. Right. And I'm praying that Barack will listen to Elohim. But if God, if Barack don't listen to Elohim, then I want Elohim's decision to rule. That's what I'm talking about. Your kingdom, your kingdom come. Pray that the Lord will take up residence in our heart. And if you take up residence in our heart and in our lives, uh, particularly those who are in rebellion, then we'll see some changes around here. There are also three aspects that you need to know of that deal with praying for God's kingdom to come. Because that's essentially what we're asking for, is for God's kingdom to come and, and convert the folk who don't believe in him. Yeah, we need to convert people. They need to believe in a God like him, and they need to believe that he sent his son, Jesus Christ. There needs to be a conversion. And not only does there need to be a conversion, after they are converted, they need to be committed. That's what we're struggling with everything in the church right now. The conversion might come. People don't have a problem many times accepting Jesus as their savior. The problem comes with letting him be their Lord. And that comes with commitment. Commitment to do the things that we're supposed to be. Let Jesus lead you. Let him be the one to guide you and direct you. And then the third thing in his kingdom coming it's for one day we want you to come and consummate this marriage. We want the groom to come get his bride. And we want you to consummate that relationship and so that your kingdom can come here. Whatever the original plan was that God had for the garden and for perfection, we want that kingdom right here. That's what we're asking for. So conversion, commitment, and then consummation. If those three things happen, then our prayer of thy kingdom come will be most, most effective. The three things, those things I just told you about pertain to God and his holiness. That's the first part of the prayer. Those, those are God word. But the, the, the next part of the prayer deals with us. And the first thing we do when we get into this part of the prayer is we seek his Provision, yeah. Give us each day our daily bread. Give us each day. How many of y'all knew yesterday what you were going to have for dinner today? <laughs> we going to such and such for dinner tomorrow is what we say. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is just as God provided for the children of Israel manna every day, that's the prayer. Lord, I'm depending on you for you to provide all my resources today. I'm not depending on me. I'm not depending on the Board of Education to provide my resources. I'm not depending on University Hospital to provide it. Lord, give me today what I need because guess what? The hospital can get mad at you. The hospital can say you violated one of our policies and we're going to snatch back the blessing we gave you. That's why I'm depending on give us this day. If all the world around me is angered at me and not supportive of me, Lord, I'm depending on you to give me this day my daily bread. History records that he takes care of his own. You remember that? Daddy, daddy, not only will he hear you, he has a responsibility to take care of you. He said in scripture that a man that won't take care of his family is worse than a heathen. So surely if God inspired a man to write that another man was a heathen, surely his holiness won't allow him to overlook his own children. David said it best and we love to repeat it. He said, I've been young and now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. And so we ask him, give us this day, each day, our daily bread. And then we ask him to do what only he can do, nobody else can do, forgive us our sins. Can't nobody forgive your sins but, but the Lord. 
Not your sins. Not your sins. Not your, your sin that made you distance from him. Only he can give us that connection back again. And he's already done that by giving us his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And so through faith in him, our sins can be forgiven. So the first thing we do in the prayer toward us is seek his provision. The next thing we do is solicit his pardon. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for, for being uh, born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Forgive me for this way that I am, and, and he's, already, he's already done it. Forgiveness of sin is the greatest need that any man has. Clean, clean my heart. And it's been my observation that people who have everything else lack, and that is the ability to forgive themselves when they do wrong. Plenty of folk walk around here suffering from depression. Why? Because they can't forgive themselves. Guilt racks us, tears us up, prevents us from being aggressive in anything we can do. Guilt is the one thing that we carry around, and it's only through a loving God that we can not only be forgiven our sins, but have the power and the courage to forgive ourselves. Yeah, forgive us our sins. Matthew 5, 23 and 24 tells us what we need to do if we have not had a forgiving heart. How many of you, don't raise your hand, has something against somebody else and you have not forgiven them? I know I ain't the only one. Yeah, these things we take and we hide deep in our heart. And we won't even acknowledge that we, uh, as y'all say, low-key mad. And we got a smile on our face. And we keep getting up in their face and smiling at them. But for real, I can't stand them. <laughs> we do that all the time. Playing games like that. Some folk have become masters of that. Everybody thinks they're always happy. And for real, they're not. They're not always happy. And even if you have the ability to fool every one of us, you can't fool God. You can't fool God. God knows all you've been doing is smiling in folk faces and your heart is blacker than black. He knows this. He knows this. And so he gives us the opportunity to simply come to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. He can reconcile you to your brother. That's what the scripture says, 23 and 24 of Matthew 5. It says, if you are at the altar today, and you are about to bring a gift to the Lord. You, about to, you just sat down and wrote your check, put it in the envelope. You're about to come put it in the basket and you remember that there's somebody that you're not right with. He said, don't put it in the basket. Leave the church. Go find the brother. Ask the brother for forgiveness. Ask the Lord to bless you and then come back and give me your offering. Don't disallow what you're about to do for me because you can't get it right with your brother. I've said it time and time again. You cannot have a good vertical relationship if you got messed up horizontal relationship. How in the world can you love God and hate everybody else? Doesn't work that way. And even if you don't hate everybody else, just hating somebody. Somebody else. Uh, me and God, we 100, but, but, yeah, my brother, my sister, my cousin, my neighbor, my co-worker, uh-uh, uh-uh, I forgive them when I get to heaven, I mean, silly stuff, silly stuff we do. Matthew 18 and 15 urges us to make things right when we got something against somebody else. In fact, it says, if your brother sins against you, go to him. Go to him. Talk to him. Don't talk about him. Don't post about him. Don't tweet about him. Don't text about him. Go to him. Talk to him. Just 
the two of you, and work that out. And then it said, if he listens to you, then you've won your brother over. Now, now that's the scripture I just quoted, but it goes even further than that. It says, if he doesn't listen to you, then come to the church and get one of the elders and sit down with the elder and see if the elder can mediate between the two of you. And if that don't work, then go to the church. Don't go to the courthouse. Don't go to six on your side. Go to the church and see if you can get it together there. Now, if you've tried to go to him, tried to get the pastor to mediate it, tried to get the church to mediate it, and none of that works, then y'all probably got something that the Lord just going to have to burn off you. But it still doesn't give you the right to go out and dog that person. And in fact, the scripture tells you, you need to be praying for that person. And that's what God instructs us to do. And so, I'm out of here. You need to seek God's provision every day. You need to solicit his pardon every day. And then we need to every day submit to his lordship. And then he said, and lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. You know, I equate this in a lot of ways, but leading us not into temptation is like saying, when you're walking past the buffet line, don't put nothing else on your plate. <laughs> you got to be careful about putting yourself in those positions. Yeah, if you know your health situation is bad, why are you at Golden Corral in the first place? And if you're there, why are you intentionally hurting yourself? by overeating. Lead us not into temptation. Can I break that down for you? That simply means, if you, if, you, if you break it down right, it simply means, don't put me to a test or a trial. Don't, don't put me in that situation. Don't let me get in a place where I need to, uh, 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 where I have to resist the power of the enemy, but protect me, even if the enemy is me. Protect me uh, from me. The word into means into the power of, all right? Into the hands of the enemy. Don't put me in that. Don't allow me to go into that situation. Temptation is a mug for us, y'all. Come on. Oh, everybody is tempted by something. Oh, don't, don't act like you're not tempted because some of us, some of us, the greatest temptation is to talk about us. Yeah, we live in a us society. We do. We do. We live in a see me, know me, hear me, like me. We live in that kind of society. And sometimes God can't be enthroned because we're on the throne. So don't lead me into loving me over and over again more than I love you. Keep me from that kind of... Test, don't let me go through that. And then we ask God to keep us from falling into the power and the pressure of those kinds of temptations. Because, look, we're not strong enough to handle that stuff, that stuff ourselves. We need him to keep us. We need him to protect us. There are some things I've gone through that it didn't matter how many times it seemed I was offered, I was going to say yes. Oh, I'm here to tell you. And then I just make this real to you. I know some addictions that people have in life that they can't break. They can't break. Those are the strongest addictions in the world. In fact, those addictions are spiritual. And they have them bound so tightly. And the only way you can break a spiritual addiction is with a greater spirit. That's the only way. You can't think your way out of heroin. You, you can't do it. You, you smoke too much reefer, you can't think your way out of not getting high. You're going to get some reefer from somewhere. You can't think your way out of not drinking. You get to the point where you need alcohol like you need air. I'm not telling you what I've heard. I'm telling you what I know. And it's like, I don't know this from court. I know this from living. 
that you'll let alcohol take over every part of your life. And guess what? It will. Yeah. It'll get rid of every relationship you have. And I'm not the only one in here who knows this. You've lived on the other side or with somebody who struggled with an addiction. That's why you have to say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from evil. There's an unknown author who summarized uh, these verses this way. I think it's instructive as I go to my seat. He says, I can't say our if I live only for myself. I can't say father if I do not endeavor each day to act like his child. I cannot say hallowed be your name if I'm playing around with sin. I cannot say your kingdom come if I'm not allowing God to reign in my life. I cannot say give us this day our daily bread if I trust only in myself. Uh, for uh, instead of God's provision. I can't say forgive us our sins if I'm nursing a grudge or withholding forgiveness for someone and I can't say lead us not into temptation if I deliberately place myself in its pathway. I gotta be true if I'm going to pray. I wanna be stronger in my prayer. I wanna be such that God listens and hears me. He blesses me. He takes care of me. But you know how you get better praying, Freddie? Pray. That, that's how you get better praying. You, you pray. It's one of those things that every time you do it, each victory helps you another to win. So if you want to be a better prayer, then you need to pray more. You're not just going to wake up in the middle of your crisis and suddenly have the relationship to be able to pray your way out of it. No, no. You need to pray when it's good and you need to pray when it's bad. You need to pray when you're happy and you need to pray when you're sad. You need to pray when somebody's born. You need to pray when somebody dies. You need to pray when you get a bonus. You need to pray when you get fired. You need to pray in every circumstance. God will grow you. And he'll know that you're depending on him for everything to be provided. I know there's somebody in here who stepped into a church this morning. And you probably didn't even understand why you were coming. You've been praying for a change. And the Lord led you here. But well, guess what? We're praying that the Lord will help you make the choice you need to make. And I'm not praying just for you to say, I want to be a part of 45th Street. My prayer is that you want to be a part of God's family. That's the most important thing you need to have, is a relationship with God. And the only way you can do that is by believing in his son, Jesus Christ. And that he died for you. That he gave his life for you. That he was buried after giving that life. And that God loved him so much that he raised him from the dead and he now lives with the Father. He's advocating for us. If you believe in that, the Bible simply says if you believe in that, then you will be saved. And so my question to you today is, are you courageous enough to make that public acknowledgement? Are you willing today to say, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. Are you ready today to say, I want to give my life to the Lord. And if I've never been baptized, I want to be baptized like we baptized Devon this morning. If you're here today while the choir stands to sing a song of encouragement, the doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, let them come. Well, there it is. I hope you were blessed by the God's word. It's my prayer that you will grow from this message. But in case you need a refresher, you can always stop by our physical location and worship with us at 7600 Division Avenue over in the East Lake community. I believe one visit and you'll find out that we truly are the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. Looking forward to meeting you. God bless you. Take care.